Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah al-Karim. Welcome back to our second episode of Lives of Dormants. I'm your host Yusuf Korma, where we will be discussing the essential nature of child uprearing and investing in our dunya and both in our akhirah. As Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said in the Quran, "Al-mal wa al-banun zinatul hayat al-dunya." So we will be discussing how to uprear children. What does the process begin? What is the roadmap to rearing children? As we know, when we are building a building, the most important thing is the foundation. So how do we set our foundation for uprearing children? And we have with us today our wonderful guest, Sheikh Asim Luqman al-Hakim. And Sheikh Asim is a teacher at Zad Academy, and he is also a, a teacher at the Knowledge International University. And he has been an imam and a teacher for over 30 years. So it's our honor and our you know, privilege to have you, Sheikh Asim. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And jazakumullahu khayran for having me. Amen wa So without further ado, inshallah ta'ala, we would like to know what is the road map for effective child rearing? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillahi wa alihi wa sahbihi wa nahtadi bi huda. It goes without saying that extramarital relationships in Islam are totally prohibited. Mm -hmm. Not only in Islam, in Christianity, in Judaism, anything that is outside the institution of marriage is prohibited. Yes. So Islam directs and channels us to getting married. And there are so many ahadith highlighting this issue of getting married and selecting the right spouse. So in order to have children, you cannot have children by artificially seminating, yeah. for example. And this is a trend that some women are doing. They want children, but they don't want to get married. So they get a donor to uh, uh, donate uh, their uh, uh, sperms and they conceive out of that. This is totally prohibited in Islam. Mm. Islam is a religion of nature. So marriage is between a man and a wife and a woman. We don't have any uh, uh, abnormal things. So when a man gets in contact with another man, this is homosexuality, this is not marriage. And it's not accepted in any religion on earth, to my knowledge, unless they've invented something just to please the LGBT, QS, WR, whatever they call them now. And a relationship between a woman and a woman is not marriage. So the natural thing is for a man to get married to a woman. Now, each one has to wisely select his or her partner. And Islam did not let things loose. Alhamdulillah, it governed it. So in the beginning, you're interested in having righteous offspring, select your spouse wisely. Mm -hmm. And how would I do that? Well, when it comes to a woman who's someone proposing to, Islam tells the guardian to check on two things or three. One, his religious practice, his religious commitment. Mm -hmm. So is he a practicing Muslim or he's a loose individual? And this is also debatable in the levels we have. So do you, Sheikh, mean that he has to be an imam, yeah. an acknowledged, uh, a renowned da'i? He has to be a person who memorizes the Quran. He has to be a teacher in a masjid. These are all parts of his religious commitment, but not all. Yeah. So first, he has to be someone who walks the talk. If I look at him, he does not sin openly. Because a person who prays five times a day, who fasts Ramadan, who goes for Hajj and gives zakat, is a Muslim. 
There are 1.8 billion Muslims. But are they all religiously practicing and committed? We have to look. If he is openly sinning, if he parties, though he prays, if he uh, uh, does things that are not accepted in Islam, such as skipping prayer with the congregation. He doesn't pray in the masjid. Mm -hmm. So how would I say that he's a practicing Muslim? If he deals with riba and works for haram uh, um, occupation, such as selling alcohol or selling intoxicants in general, selling uh, cigarettes, tobacco, haram income, dealing with the media, haram media. In this case, he is not a practicing Muslim. So there are so many things which you can judge. Not entirely, but it gives you a hint what drives this individual. So a person who prays five times a day and fasts Ramadan, he looks religiously practicing, but works in an interest-based bank. Mm -hmm. And he is a leading figure in that bank. And he is jumping up the ladder in his career path. He is not thinking of quitting. He doesn't th say, uh, he does not see anything wrong in his occupation. He's got a problem. This problem would come up later on if there's a dispute. Because whenever the spouses have a dispute, their point of reference should be Quran and Sunnah. Yes. So I can tell, sister, you're wrong. Or brother, this is unfair. So they come back to what can be commonly referred to, Quran and Sunnah. But if he's not a religiously practicing person, then he would not accept the ruling of Allah Azza wa Jal. So first of all, the Prophet says, إِذَا أَتَاكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَأَمَانَتَهُ And another narration, وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوُّجُوهُ Whenever someone comes to you proposing to your daughter, to your sister, uh, uh, whatever, and you accept his religious uh, 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 commitment okay. and practice. So this is one part. The second part is amanatahu aw khuluqahu, which is being trustworthy or his moral conduct. So can I stop you here for a second, Shay? Is what's the distinction between his deen and his akhlaq? There <coughs> is a big difference. Yes. And this difference is the core problem of the Muslim community. Mm -hmm. We have so many people who are religiously committed on the surface. So I have a long beard. My thobe is short. Usually I'll be carrying my twig, mm -hmm. my miswak. Mm -hmm. And when I talk to you, Jazakallahu khayran, Barakallahu fikum, I use Islamic words. MashaAllah, the shaykh, this is a shaykh. Mm -hmm. He's a practicing Muslim. I pray in a fashion that follows the prayer of the Prophet to yes, the letter. Yes. And I quote ayat, I quote a hadith. Whatever I do, I use Islam to govern my whole life. This is a Muslim who is religiously practicing. He is uh, uh, religiously committed, but when it comes to moral conduct, we have a big gap. Mm -hmm. So with you, I'm a good person. I joke around, I'm hos uh, hospitable, if this is the right word, yes. I'm generous, I'm this and that. When I go to my home, the way I treat my missus, the way I deal with my children, it shows like, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde personality. Yes. When I deal with other people who are not following my manhaj, as they call it, <laughs> or the way I think or believe, I treat them as vicious uh, uh, reptiles. Mm -hmm. And I consider whatever comes from them is venom. This is not the proper way. You have to go, it has to go side by side. And the role model is the Prophet ﷺ. How did he deal with disbelievers? How did he deal with 
sinners openly sinning? How did he deal with those who committed major sins, like fornication? Would he swear at them, curse them, or try to have them repent instead of coming to him and asking for capital punishment or whatever? Yeah. So this is a very important issue to take care of. Not everyone who proposes and people say, MashaAllah, he prays in the first straw, yeah. he has a big beard, and he memorizes the Qur'an, can be a good husband to your, to your daughter. Because if he has this split personality, if he deals differently than what the Qur'an and the Sunnah recommends and, 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 and commands him to do, we have a big issue. Yeah. So, so subhanAllah here you find this is a major issue because people aren't able to, to distinguish between like a religiosity, outward religiosity, and a person that has good akhlaq. So um, ideally a person that has good deen, should, it should lead to good akhlaq. Uh, it should build on a person's akhlaq, but that's not always the case. So we find people that are outwardly religious, very religious, and some, uh, you know, not malicious or anything. They just have these outward rigid practices, what we call performative Islam. So they know how to perform. They have the vernacular. They have vernacular. They have the costume, but it hasn't really reached their hearts, their intern, you know, the, the the things inside of them. Uh, as Allah Subhanahu wa Taala said that He made haram for us the things of the batin and the dahir. So they have the dahir, but the batin isn't hasn't you know been perfected yet. So, but it's hard to look at a person and recognize that. It is hard, but <coughs> this is not the problem. The problem is that most people, and I've seen in my life, which is not very short, alhamdulillah, mm. I've seen a lot of practicing people yes. turning uh, back on their heels. Mm. So, so many practicing people, it's imams, da'is, who had long beards, and boom, it went almost less than a fist mm. uh, uh, length. So. There's a difference of opinion among scholars whether the beard should be left alone or to cut a fist length. They are doing the fist length from top instead of the bottom. This is a sign. But then you can see that they're free mixing, that they have weird ideas, that they're teaching people deviant thoughts. What is this? Ten years ago you were doing well. Yes, but their inside is different than what's on the outside. And this is what's causing this. Yes, Sheikh. Thank you for the uh, beautiful answer. We're going to stop for a break, pause this episode, but we'll be back with our series of life's adornments. Please stay tuned and join us back until you come back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to our second segment of Life of Dormance with Sheikh Asim. Uh, we last stopped talking about when a man comes to a family to look for to uh, look for a wife. What are the things that you should look for in his character? And we stopped by talking about his deen and his akhlaq. And inshallah ta'ala you can continue, Sheikh. Okay, so the religious commitment is important. A lot of the guardians, when the, someone proposes to their uh, uh, daughter or, or sister, fail to investigate and come after a couple of years mm -hmm. complaining that the guy is a drug addict or he abuses women or he lies, a compulsive liar. Akhi, why didn't you ask wh wh who to, to ask, Sheikh? You have to go and check the man. Go to the masjid where he claims to pray. I remember so many times I get people coming to me and say, Sheikh, do you know so-and-so? I said, no. Nope. They say, Sheikh, he lives next to your masjid. I said, I've never seen this person. Mm -hmm. They show me his, his picture and the man doesn't pray in the masjid at all. If the imam doesn't know the person, then this gives you an insight of what a person he is. Mm -hmm. So you have to do your due diligence. Ask and check his uh, uh, friends, his family members, his colleagues at work and at, at school so that you can sketch a profile of what a person he is. Now, religious commitment 
we're done and through with. There is another part where the Prophet ﷺ tells us to check upon his akhlaq, his moral conduct. So you have to check his companions, his relatives, his colleagues about how he deals with people. So if they all say, oh, he is a good person, but he's so stingy, yeah. he doesn't spend mm -hmm. a dime. This is go he's going to make your daughter's life miserable. Cross him out. If they say he's generous, but to the extent that he doesn't save a penny, again, this is a problem. If they say no, in, spend, in expenditure, he's good. He's generous and he's kind and he saves money. He manages his financing quite well, but he has a problem with anger issues and fits. Mm -hmm. This is a total uh, disaster. Stay away from this person. Mm. If they tell you that he doesn't fight, he doesn't shout, he doesn't scream, but he flirts yeah. with females and, and co-workers and uh, he has no problem in mixed gatherings, again, this would corrupt your daughter and influence her negatively in the future. So all of these things have to be a, a combination which Certainly. you should look into. What is his relationship with his parents? If his parents say that he's dutiful, he's kind, he's loving, he takes his sister's places, he drives them, he takes her, his mother shopping, and you know that this guy is a family man. Mm -hmm. But if they say, we don't see him except for half an hour once a week, now, this is bad news, and so on. Yeah. So uh, I think theoretically it makes sense. You, you, you have a list of things that you're looking for, but isn't it really difficult to reduce a person just to a list of things not truly understanding the fullness of their humanity. Perhaps a person has these deficiencies, but they're working on it, something they're getting better over time. Or do you immediately look at the red flags and say no? Or are there some considerations that you can make some, like a lead way a person, you know, uh, he prays a salat on time, he has a good akhlaq, but as you said, he's a flirt. Or he has these little deficiencies in his character. And how do you know when to break and when to sort of uh, give lead way? There are red flags. Yes. So if someone, tells me that this individual flares up in seconds and he has anger issues, rage issues. I would definitely not wait for him to yes. develop and improve yes. because <coughs> I'm not willing to gamble with my daughter's life and marriage. But there are things that, okay, I may not compromise in this day and age if someone is, for example, um, not praying in the masjid, mm -hmm. but is well known to be praying on time. Yes. So I may compromise because it, the, the demand is far less than the supply. Mm. If you raise the bar and keep it high, you end up not getting your daughter married. Mm -hmm. So you have to go a little bit down, but there are red lines you cannot cross. Yes. So someone who flirts, someone who has anger issues, someone who is unable to communicate. It's only Simon says. Someone who has weird ideas, and this comes in the beginning. When someone comes, and I've seen so many things, I do a lot of marriage counseling mm -hmm. between the spouses. So I've, I see a lot of this on daily basis. Someone goes and proposes, and he asks, the woman he's proposing to in the presence of her guardian, are you a virgin? Mm. Have you ever had sexual relationships? Mm. I would take my shoe yes, well, and beat the heck out of him yeah. out of my home. Yeah. This is inappropriate. You are in a respected family's uh, a house and you're asking a woman who did not marry before if she's a virgin or not. This is uh, inappropriate, un-Islamic. If the person from the initial interview comes and says, listen, I'm interested in marrying, your guardian is here, but you're not the only one I'm gonna marry. I'm gonna take two or three wives in the future. This is a lunatic. He's not even capable of thinking straight. Akhi, you want to get married in the future? Let that come at the future, not now. So there are things, there are signs that makes it or breaks it. And this is what a, a father should be aware of. Okay, so we talked about 
when the male comes to seek the hand of the daughter of the sister or likewise. Uh, what about the event when a man is looking for a spouse? What are some things that he should look for when seeking a righteous wife? Well, the Prophet ﷺ told us in an authentic hadith that a woman, a woman is sought after for four reasons. For her wealth, for her lineage, for her beauty, and for her religious commitment. So, choose the one with the religious commitment, or may you be holding something like dust mm -hmm. in your hands, meaning nothing. Now, the Prophet is not telling us, choose someone who is religiously committed, who's ugly, poor, yeah, sure. and from a bad family. Mm -hmm. No, he's saying that this should be your measuring tool the religion, and if she's Miss Universe, wow, that beats everything. Right. And if she's wealthy and an orphan at the same time, inherited billions, you've got it made. And if she's from a reputable lineage and family, alhamdulillah, this is heaven. But usually these four are only found in Jannah with the Hur al-Ain. So the most you should focus on is her religious commitment. It goes without saying that also her moral conduct goes side by side yes. because sometimes you choose a woman who's a hijabi, who's a niqabi, who wears gloves, black from head to toe, nothing is seen, mashallah, excellent. But her moral conduct is zero. She does not respect her husband, she is always cursing and uh, 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 using abusive words. She has rage fits. And this you cannot stay married to. And you can definitely not expect her to raise good children. So you have to do what people call in management 360 examination and profiling. So you have to ask her colleagues, her parents, her elders, and those who are under her so that you can make a good idea of who you're getting engaged to. Okay, uh, last question. Typically in uh, Muslim Islamic uh, societies, you find people getting married rather quickly. So if a marriage, if a courting process is, let's say, three months, six months, a year, which is, you know, not the norm, how are you within this constrained time able to assess a person's character and their ability to be a good spouse? The essence of all what we do in life is trusting Allah, mm. to have full tawakkul and dependence and reliance on Allah Azza wa Jal. Yes. This <coughs> doesn't mean at all that you do not do your due diligence. But at the end of the day, your heart is connected with Allah, even after all the investigation you had done and committed. It's like buying a watermelon. So it's green from the outside. You knock it here, knock it there. By the sound, you can try to guess whether it's red sweet or white than uh, uh, bitter. Mm -hmm. And you only know that after you open it. In marriage, it's almost the same. We don't have any um, engagement period or let's say dating period. So it's not me dating a woman for three months and then if we, there's chemistry, we're compatible, we get married. Because I had a Mar an American friend, who we used to go to the gym together and <laughs> work out, and this guy was like in his late 30s, early 40s. And every time I see him, he's a Christian. And I say, you're not married yet, man. What's, what's wrong with you? He said, no, I'm, I'm still looking for the right one. And I keep telling him, Achi, He's not Achi, sorry, this is, <laughs> this is for you. I keep telling him, the right one will never come. Mm. Now show me your black book, your, your, your address, contact agendas, just for uh, 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 out of curiosity. How many girls that you've dated and seen? So, so many. Mm -hmm. Achi, by the way you're doing, you'll never get married. In Islam, it's different. In Islam, you do your due diligence, they tell you this is a good girl, you ask around, you propose, you see her, she sees you, 
and then there's chemistry, you hope for the best and you get married. 99.9%, and this is a big percentage, yes. things work out. I got ma married with the grace of Allah 36 years ago in the same fashion. And I'm still happily married. Mm -hmm. I don't know my, my wife prior to the engagement. And I don't have anything. We get to know one another till date. And we live like this because I have shortcomings. So whenever she does have her own shortcomings, I always look at mine and say, touche. So I accept her for what she, who she is. She accepts me for who I am. And we live, inshallah, in, in love and happiness. Alhamdulillah. That's amazing advice, Sheikh. May Allah bless you and reward you. Yeah. Unfortunately, this is the end of our segment today. Uh, thank you for sharing with, with us all your knowledge. Uh, for our viewers, inshallah, stay tuned with us for our next episode of Life's Adormous. We hope that you benefit it. Until next time, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.